All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Uh, welcome to Scope. My name is Martine Sevran, and I am a lifestyle photographer based here in Chicago. And I know that you are coming in from all across the U.S. and perhaps all across the world. So hello from Chicago. This episode of Scope is brought to you by American Photographic Artists, uh, also known as APA, as we all know, and the APA Diversity Committee. As a reminder, APA is a not-for-profit organization for photographers who are primarily in the advertising, editorial, and commercial sectors. APA's mission is to help photographers succeed through the establishment of community, education, and advocacy. And I have the pleasure of being the chair of APA's Diversity Committee, which hosts SCOPE. SCOPE is a series on diversity, which is designed to help us understand and consider the challenges of our peers and to find solutions for better working environments. To learn more about SCOPE and about the Diversity Committee um, and becoming a member, please visit apanational.org for more information. And while you are there, Please note that the Diversity Committee is looking for new board members to join us and to do work such as SCOPE and to do work to um, help our um, members who are from traditionally marginalized um, groups flourish as photographers. So thank you so much for joining us for this talk about representation and diversity in the photo community. But before we get into the scope itself, I wanted to chat about what we are going to cover during this one hour together. You know, the photography world has changed so much and we get a sense that we are, <clears throat> we are living in a time where clients are actively looking to work with BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus artists. Given that's the case, the question for me and the question that we're going to try to answer today, how do artists own their narrative to get in the door and to get work and to network with the people who are actually going to hire them down the line? And how do those artists focus on not just checking a box, but while they are in discussion, really bring their unique point of views to fore? So I'm pleased to welcome Liz Miller Gershfeld to Scope. Today, Liz will talk about new ways of connecting with your network. And in addition, Liz will discuss how to have more productive client meetings and present your portfolio in novel ways. Once Liz finishes her short presentation, we will enter into a broader conversation with our guest and producer based here in Chicago, Rita Bowie. So welcome, Rita, and welcome, Liz. And I'm going to quickly read Liz's amazing bio. I have the pleasure of practicing this out loud, <laughs> so I'm going to read it to all of you. So Liz Miller Gershfeld grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and moved to Chicago after graduating from Michigan State University with a degree in journalism. Shortly after moving to Chicago, Liz got involved in the film community, working in various aspects of production from PA to craft services, casting to talent wrangling and producing for a commercial director. Eventually, she moved toward her passion, which is photography and working with photographers, which she has been doing for the past 23 years. Liz has been producing award-winning work for clients such as Jack Daniels, Woodford Reserve, Old Forester, Herodora, American Egg Board, Ocean Spray, Wrigley, Kerrygold, Canadian Club, and others. Liz has been a panelist and speaker for the APA, ASMP, Geek Fest, NOLA, PDN, Commune, the AMA, POA, and Photo Shelter. Can you, can you guess that we're actually really glad to have her talk with you through Scope? Um, so she has also judged uh, photo competitions for PDN, the APA Archive Magazine, and Columbia College's Manifest Graduate Competition. 
Liz has also curated for exhibits and auctions for charity. Now, she sounds really impressive and really she is, but just to put her in terms of like being a normal person, she is a year round bike commuter and she lives in the city of Chicago. So now we're going to talk to you a little bit about Rita. So, because Rita is going to join us in a conversation after Liz's presentation, as I mentioned earlier. Rita Bowie was born in Paris, France. Her parents immigrated from the Republic Democratic of Congo in the 80s. Growing up in fashion, design, and art, growing up, I'm sorry, growing up, fashion, design, and art played a huge part of her life. She speaks three languages and loves traveling, which allowed her to broaden her mind and assimilate better into different cultures. After high school, she moved to London and earned a degree in international business. She previously worked in New York and Chicago as a model, stylist, seamstress in the fashion industry. Her fashion background allows her to use those skills on various photo and video shoots. She has an eye to cast the right talent, and she often assists talent with wardrobe styling and model coaching. She is currently the executive producer and majority owner of Bowie Productions, a full-service photo and video agency dedicating to telling stories that matter. Rita and Liz, welcome. Mm -hmm. At this point, I'm going to turn the, the mic over to you, Liz, so that you can... Um, bless us and grace us with your with your presence thank you thank you so much thank you martine and rita i'm delighted that you're here today and i just want to thank the apa diversity committee for having me and all of you for being here i hope this conversation will be useful and i'm so appreciative to be a part of it um thank you for the great introduction and I don't think I need to tell you too much more. I'll give you a little background on myself. My personal pronouns are she, her. As you know, I grew up in Detroit. I live in Chicago and spent the last 23 years at Energy BBDO, where I was an executive art producer. Um, I resigned in the fall to explore what else might be possible for myself, given this uh, oddball collection of skills I've acquired over the last decades. Uh, while being still intentional about remaining a part of the photo communities that I love. Now, for anyone who doesn't know what an art producer does, it's a role which finds the right artists, photographers, illustrators, painters, muralists, CGI artists, really whatever kind of artist or artists are needed to bring an idea to life. Uh, in the past, it was uh, mostly ideas that didn't move, still images, but that's rare anymore, uh, that projects don't include a motion component. So my role was to find the artists for consideration and then work the process of assigning and producing projects. And this includes working with a creative team, having creative calls, finding the right creative fit, working with the client team, working through the business aspects, the financials and the licensing, and then staying with the project through production. So I wanna to talk to you today about intentional networking, effective meetings and dynamic portfolios, specifically in the realm of commercial photography. I think about how intimidating networking can be for artists. There is really no playbook on it. And as artists, your portfolio is never done. So it never feels completely ready to be shown. It feels very vulnerable. And yet there's nothing more important you can do for your career than mindful networking. Obviously creating the work you're gonna show is your first job. And the most important thing, it can take up all your time. But once you have a reasonable body of work, it's imperative to include networking in your workflow. I'd like to touch on a difficult paradox. And honestly, I have more questions than answers. As diverse creatives, there's never been a time like now when brands and agencies are specifically looking for you. They're intentionally looking to widen the lens, both in front of and behind the camera. As diverse creatives, there's a marketing benefit to leading with your BIPOC. 
LGBTQIA plus or disabled identities. As well, this industry has historically marginalized all of you. I'm glad there's an impetus to change that. I've also learned about something called stereotype threat. Claude Steele, who's an emeritus psychology professor at Stanford, is one of the most influential social psychologists. He did groundbreaking research on stereotype threat, prejudice, and self-affirmation. Steele describes stereotype threat as a fear that you're going to be potentially stereotyped for an aspect of your identity, especially when you perceive that the stakes are high. Feelings that one is confirming a stereotype or will be seen as a stereotype. You feel a, a threat in the air, constant background processing, a lot of worrying, fretting. He calls this feeling churn because it can create negative circular feelings. And that distraction seems to interfere with performance. Steele also talks about something powerful that reduces stereotyping and stereotype threat. And that's actually getting to know someone a little. So in other words, getting past a single data point about a person. And then the most powerful aspect of his work is around affirmation. I'm not talking about Stuart Smalley style affirmation. It's knowing something about yourself you can count on, knowing what you're good at, growing your own sense of power by spending real time with those thoughts. This is why I describe this as a paradox. Leading with a single data point does not begin to describe who you are and can create a sense of churn, but that data point can help get you in the room. It's really about your personal agency around creating your own story, owning how you describe yourself, and then getting in the room and creating more data points with a lot of people. Let's talk about growing your network. Mindfully growing your network is a meticulous process. If you're at the beginning of your career, you're building professional relationships that will change and grow over time. I would reach out to photographers you respect who are further along in their careers. They can give you excellent feedback and mentorship. It's also valuable to meet photographers at the same stage as you. You're going through solo journeys in a way and it helps to have people who know how it feels and can bounce questions off of. Visit every source book to learn who other photographers are and immerse yourself in how they structure their websites. Reach out to potential collaborators hair and makeup artists, prop stylists, wardrobe stylists, food and beverage stylists, any potential collaborators who are also developing portfolios of their own and whose creative ideas line up with yours. Whatever your genre or interest, start to develop relationships with people you would like to make test work with. Reach out to talent agents who always have new talent who need photography. When you start bidding on jobs, you want a team to present with you. As you continue, you want to meet photo and line producers. I know in the beginning, most artists self-produce, but when the time comes, they'll help you scale productions, give you introductions to more crew and resources, and will help make sure the business aspects of working with corporate clients are handled properly. When you're ready to start meeting with potential clients, you're gonna to wanna to talk to ad agencies, design firms, companies that build apps, internal creative agencies within clients' walls, and nonprofits that speak to causes you care about. There are many people and organizations who would like to get to meet you. I would like you to take a deep breath and get comfortable with reaching out. You will reach out more often than you will receive a response. That's not a rejection, it's just how it works. There are no official rules to this except be ready. As you continue with this process, you'll evolve how you craft your introduction based on what works. What works is always the guidepost. I want you to reach out to all the agency producers, art producers, integrated producers, content producers, and just plain producers whether they have an associate, a senior, or an executive in front of their title. I want you to reach out to creatives, specifically art directors at all levels. I know some creatives don't meet with artists. They'll ignore you or refer you to producers, but 
I've also known many creatives who love to have relationships with artists. Sometimes they have ideas they want to test. They will be your greatest champions. It's well worth going through the people who ignore to get to these gems. As well, in some organizations, the project managers act as producers. They're worth seeking out. At the very least, they can help point you in the right direction. LinkedIn is a powerful platform for making connections and helping to find the people in the roles that I mentioned. As well, it's a great tool for learning and gathering intelligence. Look for groups, ad color, LGBTQ plus advertising, media, and marketing, advertising and disability. These are just a few of the groups on LinkedIn that can give insights into the conversations happening in organizations, as well as opportunities for networking beyond a cohort of photographers. Other groups like advertising and marketing industry professionals, photography industry professionals, producers network, media and entertainment professionals, and my new favorite, the AI artists salon group are all places to learn, connect and engage. I'm sure you'll find more once you start looking. The 3% movement is an incredible resource. It's 3percentmovement.com with the number three. They're a network of creative professionals and clients whose mission is anchored by the truth that creativity equals diversity equals profitability. Please spend time with this resource not only to hear some of their excellent speakers and read their articles, but to identify people to network with. They are on the leading edge of allyship. Last, I wanna direct you to the LeBook website under the tab that says networking. You'll see their connections events and jurors reach out to each and every person. A network is extremely valuable. And if you decide to work with an agent, having a network puts you in a position of strength. Okay, now you're making headway on getting a few meetings. Let's talk about what happens then. I'm also going to touch on what I mean by dynamic portfolios. Over the past 23 years, I've had thousands of meetings with photographers and agents. I want to reflect and share a little about what makes them effective. What do all the meetings have in common? A show and tell. From there, it's entirely up to you. Dancing with the Paradox, a truly effective meeting has both a clear intention, but is also open to possibilities you can't predict. Conversations help you clarify your vision. Not what's in front of the camera, that's you. I mean how you want it to all fit together, who you wanna work with, the kinds of jobs which may be available to you. Of course, the goal of meeting with potential clients is to get work but I wanna widen your definition of success. The goal of a meeting should be to form a long arc, trusting, respect-filled relationship, which leads to good work and repeat business. I want you to have that goal in your mind with every meeting you have. Your professional story is yours to tell. I want you to know that you have personal agency or power in how you relate to everything and everyone. The more intentional you are about how you use that agency, I think you're going to find that your outcomes are going to be more positive. I want to come back to Claude Steele's work on affirmations. Everyone has something they feel confident about. It doesn't matter if it's related to your work. Spending time with those thoughts as a form of meditation helps to bring your most confident and powerful self into the room and minimizes the sense of churn. It gives weight to the thought that you have something important to say. I have something important to say has got to be your mindset before you enter any meeting. This applies to your work and to the conversation, whether this is in person or on a platform like Zoom. You say it with your work and your whole presentation. It's a fact that you embody. And when I meet with you, I want it to be true. I want you to be successful because when you are, then I as a producer can more skillfully play my part in bringing ideas to life. For your meeting, always have your presentation put together and ready. 
coming back to the importance of mutual respect and how to convey it, the first question you should ask is how much time do you have? And do you have a hard stop? Typically in a meeting with a client, I'll say, I wanna respect your time. Please let me know how much time we have. With that knowledge, you can manage the time and control the flow of the meeting. And you've set a professional and respect-filled tone. It's a good idea to edit your work into three presentation lengths, a short presentation, a regular length, and a bonus presentation of personal work, sort of like the encore after a standing ovation. If someone really is short on time, you can share your shorter presentation. And if you have any time left, you can chat. If someone has more time, like half an hour, your presentation can be a little longer, and then you have more time to talk or show bonus work. Back to being highly intentional about every part of the meeting, I want you to think about what your goals are in showing your work. My perspective is the goal should be to show who you are as an artist and to show who you are as a professional. To the first goal, showing who you are as an artist. This is such an opportunity for you both to get excited about the meeting. This is your moment. It doesn't matter what stage of your career you're in. You can speak to what inspired you to get into photography. You can speak to your influences, what you love about it. If you sense that the person you're talking to is open, they'll feel that inspiration. This is a great opportunity to share your story as you choose because stories are the most unforgettable things for human beings. If you don't have time or sense an openness, get right to the work. Still, make sure you open your portfolio with something you're inspired by and can speak to. Let the person you're meeting with feel why this is inspiring to you. I've met with photographers over the years who have led with their inspiration, something they love about or in their work. I never forget them, whether they're just starting out or are further along. It's such a contagious feeling. It makes people want to work with you. The truth is, most jobs that are assigned are not the highly inspiring ones. Most jobs are pretty tactical, but for the special jobs, the highly creative, highly collaborative, potentially award-winning, we're coming back to you to try to touch the magic again. We wanna know how you wanna bring it to life kind of jobs. The only people being considered for those are the ones who show who they are as an artist first. And I promise that doing the tactical jobs do not diminish you as an artist. To the second goal, showing who you are as a professional, my first piece of advice is to be honest about your level of experience. This ladders back to trust, which is a critical element to being considered for work. This honesty only enhances your level of professional esteem. People love to be a part of a success story when they meet you and you're just getting started and they can have any small part in helping you along toward a successful career, that's a gratifying thing. If you're getting started in your professional career, be clear about what you're hoping for from the meeting. Perhaps it's establishing relationships, getting a sense of what's working in the portfolio, what it could use more of. You may have some questions about the business. If the meeting goes well, it's not inappropriate to ask if the person has anyone they could suggest you meet with. I've always heard you should leave a meeting with two names. Don't wait until you've, you're established to start showing the work. You're laying a foundation for your future success. You're investing other people in your success. They want to play a part, however big or small, in propelling your career along. If you're showing me who you are as a professional, as a more established photographer, I want to hear about the kinds of problems you solve. What kinds of things do you produce? Stills, GIFs, videos, stop motion? Whatever you do, tell me about it. What city or cities do you work in? How about your team? Do you have one producer or different producers for different locations and types of projects? I wanna hear how you incorporate diversity into your work through your crew and your talent. Are you set up for post-production? Tell me an interesting way you've packaged a project if you do that. Don't wait to be asked, talk about all of it. How do you manage remote shoots, hybrid? Can you fly a drone? Do you handle casting and talent in an interesting way? This is a great chance to let the person you're meeting with know your broader skills. And if you did a project you're proud of in an interesting way, 
create a concise presentation and lock it into a PDF. I'm talking about many highly specific case study presentations. You should make one for every project you do that shows unique and dynamic problem solving. And then you also have them to include in your treatments if you have a case study section. And if you talk about what you do enough with enough people, that moment will happen where a client is going to need a problem solved that has, a, that has similar dynamics to what you did. And you will be 10 steps ahead of your competition. Touching on the other side of the meeting paradox, the part where you're open to the possibilities you can't predict. There are a few tactics which can open the possibilities a little wider. Bring your own full openness, curiosity, and respect. Bringing open statements like, tell me about, what do you think about, and how did you get to that opinion? Crack a dialogue way open and show true curiosity, an excellent trait in a photographer. You can ask, tell me about some of your challenges. What are some of the problems you solve in your work? Tell me about changes you've noticed in our business. What are some of the qualities you look for in a photographer? What kinds of things are you working on now? It's helpful if you do a little research on the person or organization you're meeting with. Tell stories, keep them narrative and engaging. Avoid getting into the weeds of the technical challenges to make the photos, but rather illustrate the stories around them. The point is to make them memorable. Your portfolio is a dynamic creation. It's a living tool. It's never finished. It represents your vision and your skill set, your partners and collaborators, resources. It will never be all things to all people. You're going to need to be very choiceful as you listen to feedback. Not everyone is skilled at giving feedback. You'll hear a lot of opinions. Please collect many data points and then use them to make workable changes. As you develop the flow of your portfolio, it will be in a dynamic state where it's always growing. When I see a portfolio I haven't seen in a while, there are changes I look for. I love to see development and conceptual thinking, a visual point of view, and an ability to scale production up or down. I also look for growth in production resources and partners, as well as higher production values. And when your portfolio is in a really good place, it will have a little of what you've been doing, a little of what you are doing, and lean into a little of where you want to go. It contains work you've made, but it's not you. It's work that went from your imagination to being outside of you. It's mission critical to be objective about this tool. Release yourself from your attachment to your work. Understand that it's separate and outside of you. When you can successfully do this, you can look at your work more objectively. You can remove the work that is not creating productive results for you. You'll also be able to take in feedback about your work in an unemotional way. I understand that this is very difficult mental yoga. It may take a lifetime to truly detach yourself in this way, but it's something to stretch toward. I'd like to briefly touch on the follow-up. This is a critical part of the process. After the meeting, always send an email. Be specific about something you talked about or something you got from the meeting. Ask if you can send email promotions now and then. I feel like every couple months is a good cadence. LinkedIn, like I spoke about before, LinkedIn is a powerful business tool if you use it well. It's a great way to unintrusively promote yourself and you can craft a slightly different message than in your email promos. Follow them on Instagram if they don't have a private account. This is a space that's purely visual and you can show a higher volume of work. You can experiment and try different things and get real-time feedback in different ways. Now you have three ways to keep you and your work in their consciousness. Each one of these has its own cadence and language. And if you use them well, can be a really impactful continuation of your conversation. I'd like to leave you with one thought. You deserve to be in the room. You have the right to show your work to every decision maker. Whether or not they like your work or the work is right for a job, that part is on you. You have every right to show your work, which contains the fullness of you as an artist. 
and as a professional, which transcends and includes identity and all your experiences contributed to the wholeness that is each and every one of you. Your job is to create work that works for you and to be an aggressive networker. Your choice is how you tell the story of yourself. What you want to include is entirely up to you. If you choose to lead with identity or let it emerge, that's your choice, no one's but yours. I appreciate the work it's taken to get to this point in time and the path forward is yours to create. And I truly thank you for giving me this time to talk to you. Wow. <laughs> um, I think I need to, I'm so glad this is being recorded because I think I need to listen again. Um, I didn't know this, but this is exactly what I needed to hear today. So thank you so much, Liz. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I think at this point, um, I have a few follow-up questions for you and also for Rita, who's been um, waiting really patiently. Um, but before I ask those questions, I wanted to ask Rita, do you have anything that you would like to comment on or add um, to Liz's presentation? It's, it's been an amazing presentation. Thank you, Liz. It's a good reminder that um, you have to believe in yourself in your work. And it's encouraging, very encouraging, and good reminders about networking, follow up with um, clients, and just believing in yourself in your work that you have a unique perspective and you should be proud for that. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, Liz, my question for you is um, to rely on, to lean on your 23 plus years of experience, particularly in um, thinking about the stereotype threat, which I didn't realize that this was a thing. So I'm glad that you um, chatted and I'm looking forward to learning more about that. And I have to say for myself, honestly, before I go to meet with a creative, I am often, I feel like there's so much that has to happen prior to even meeting with them to make sure that they understand that I am indeed a person of color. And that way, when we do meet that there's, there's like, they, they know what, what, what's coming down the pike. And I wonder for you, um, if you have any thoughts or suggestions in terms of how um, photographers of color and photographers from traditionally marginalized groups can actually prime the creative or prime the producer or prime the whoever it is that they're meeting with to um, to know what to expect. Because I think to show up as yourself is one thing to show up and be given room to express yourself and to be heard and to be, to be taken seriously is something else altogether. And I feel like this is something oftentimes um, that um, some of our members who come from those groups may, um, may come across. Yes, that's, that's an excellent question. And the notion of priming is one that I am so appreciative of you creating a sensitivity and me about that it would help um, the person who is coming to present feel more comfortable that they are more understood before they arrive. And I would just say that looking to the work of uh, Claude Steele, multiple data points are such an, such an important piece of this. So if you introduce yourself and include a descriptor about your identity, you're uh, an artist who is a person of color and you are a lifestyle artist and you and, and a lot of ands. I think the more um, salient points that you feel are important, 
are a, a fair thing to include in an introduction so that you feel that they have at least received that message and then you can you know have the table set when you when you meet with them i hope that answered that yeah, I mean, that answers it. Yeah. Um, Rita, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Uh, no, that was perfectly well said. Um, so Liz, I know that you had some questions for me and Rita. Um, yes. Do we want to transition to that, to the conversation part of our um, of our presentation? Yes. Well, I feel like my question to you is sort of the, the inverse of what you asked me. And that was, can you discuss how you own and include identity in your presentation? And, and uh, should aspects of identity be a part of the conversation? Rita, I'm going to let you speak since I spoke so much. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do, I like that question a lot. And um, I appreciate um, you, Louise and Martin, inviting me to share about my experience, especially being from France. I have a completely different experience. And um, I do talk, um, I do share about my identity, not necessarily as a black woman here in America, but mostly as someone being born and raised in France, because it shaped who I am as a person, how I see things, how I relate to art in general. And, uh, and I love sharing that, especially because we do uh, produce videos and tell stories. It's important for me to tell um, individuals in general that we can relate to the stories with our unique experience and um i feel like comfortable here in america embracing my dual identity as a black woman and also as a french woman compared to france which could be shocking but i think um it's um it's very encouraging for me to to be able to own it and talk about it in my profession. And for aspects about identity, I will say uh, cultural background um, that should be included as well because there's so much diversity within the Black community or even um, other minorities and um, of various upbringing life experiences and um, religion, different type of careers, it does shape who you are as a person. And I think that sh it should be included a part of identity. Uh, thank you, Rita. I think for me, um, I always think about it from the viewpoint of the, as a photographer, um, in terms of the stories that I'm, I'm telling or, and, thinking about what are some of the things that we are saying or not saying through whatever setup that we are creating. And I have, um, I, I always have an eye to microaggressions and how sometimes that gets um, communicated through photography uh, from a grouping, you know, how do you pose a group uh, what does that say? Who is at the forefront of the camera and who is in the background? Um, and I think as well, Rita, as someone who identifies as a Black woman, as an American, but also um, particularly from the Caribbean, I'm also hyper aware of how um, otherism is portrayed here in America, which is very different than how other places do it. And to make sure that um, I'm, I, to make sure that I understand what's, I don't know. I think uh, being an outsider and being and being able to see how this society has is constructed helps me 
ask more pointed question. Is there a reason why we want to um, have the, for example, since Liz, you mentioned uh, case studies, is there a reason why in this one particular scene, we have all of the people of color doing, doing menial work mm -hmm. um, and then those who are, are white um, doing, you know, blue collar work because I mean sometimes depending on the client and if you have four people in a scene and different that the talent is interacting in different ways with products there are some ways where we can we're sending a message mm -hmm. that is um just um, um a message that really makes sure that the status quo and maintains its place and if we want to push the envelope how can we push the envelope from just even posing um and who's in the foreground versus the background so I always think about these things that's great and I think that those sorts of perspectives are incredibly useful and valuable to people who maybe just weren't sensitive to that <laughs> before and that would be um, that would be such a benefit for everyone to learn from on the agency side. And I think they're trying to do better jobs of it, but not everybody has developed that sensitivity. I guess I have a, a kind of a follow-up question for you, Rita. How have you seen um, or how have you been able to leverage your experience and your background to um communicate to whether it's the client or um the director who whoever it is um that's directing um the whatever job you're on how do you how, how are you able to communicate when things aren't going well um and help people kind of nudge them or present your point of view how do you do that it's a good question. Um, do you mind repeating the question again? It's a long sure. question. Sure. So how do you, um, when you see something that could be potentially problematic, um, which could potentially be, for example, microaggressions within um, the storyline that you're, you're telling, or how are you, how do you communicate your point of view and suggest changes um, or, or communicate notes? Um, I mean, usually, like, we're pretty selective with the clients we work with, and um, yeah, I'm trying to translate that accurately because I never encounter that as an issue in the past. <clears throat> yeah, I will say that my experience mostly with client has been positive thank god when it comes to when it comes to that when it comes to issues and um yeah it's been positive mostly i don't know i'm not really answering your question but I'm to <laughs> that's a good thing <laughs> I'm i think it's kind of a good thing that it's been positive yes Um, Liz, did you have another question? Yeah. So just thinking about the this space that we've been talking about, the space of getting in the door and meeting creatives and producers and and getting more client work as diverse creatives, I want to and produce diverse producers. I wanted to ask, what does progress look like in this space to you? Um, I think having conversation like this webinar and bringing people that are looking to hire diverse talents and diverse artists that wants to be hired and create a safe space for people to share about the journey and have honest conversations. I think that's what because that's what progress will look like to me because there are some mentoring programs already and some initiatives. But I think to me, it's having conversations where people could ask questions uh, that will 
then help them grow and as artists and see it from um, a potential recruiter's perspective. Yeah. Um, I guess for me, progress would be that um, that while at this point um, in my career, my portfolio is very diverse um, and I make sure that as much as possible to influence um, talent choice <laughs> in that direction. And so my portfolio is very diverse and I hope for me progress would be that just because my portfolio is diverse, it doesn't mean that I cannot photograph and tell what are uh, what are seen as white stories. I yeah. think that as creatives, um, we we can do we can do a lot. And I think when someone has a unique eye and brings an artistic perspective, that should be um, that should really be valued. Um, having said that, I think there also is a space for certain photographers to tell the stories. For example, a photographer who identifies as um, Asian could potentially tell, be hired to tell a story um, from that person's heritage, because there are things I can say that as a Black photographer, um, and even one that identifies as being from the Caribbean, there are certain things that I just don't see that I mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to see from that perspective, you know, um, and I think it's sometimes it's a give and take and it's hard and it's easy to say, well, that person shouldn't have photographed whatever campaign. But then at the same time, I think who can tell the better story is um, that often happens behind closed doors. And I hope progress for me is that multiple people from different perspectives will be able to be considered to tell stories. Yes. So not only telling your own stories, but telling multiple stories that aren't from your own life experience, but from your experience, you can tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious um, to all to those points, what would you, and this is for both of you, what would you like to see happen in this space where clients are actively trying to widen the lens and work with diverse artists, how can they do better? Um, I mean, for me, it will be for clients to actually hire diverse talents because they have a unique perspective and approach not necessarily because they have to do it out of obligation in light of what's happening in the media yeah. or because they have to meet a quota and i shared that and i could share like a personal story like there's like a website i won't say the name but that mentioned a lot about mentorship opportunities for producers and people in the industry and it was i did reach out to the contact that they listed not necessarily because I want to take advantage of um, the program helping minority owned businesses, but because I do want to grow and learn, especially from key players in the industry and get valuable insight about my work and how I can do better. And, um, and I did reach out to a couple of um, agent of producers, but I got no response. So you ask yourself, are they advertising it because they truly care and they truly want to help? Or are they advertising because they have to do it and it's out of obligation? So for me, it will be caring. And like you said, having a conversation, feedback, and being able to, to, to talk openly about the industry and how we could improve. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Gosh, um, that's a really great question. I think 
uh, potentially, I think this, this, uh, my answer came from your presentation actually lives, because I think if it is that we are more likely to um, connect with someone when we meet them, then I guess more opportunities for photographers of color, photographers who identify as um, disabled, as LGBTQIA+, photographers from, you know, that have not necessarily been able to get in the door for there to be an active way for, say, producers or creatives to meet with, with them to, to look at their work um, mm -hmm. and to meet with them. Because sometimes it is, you know, sometimes it's, it's really difficult for to actually get a face-to-face -face meeting. So more face-to-face yeah. -face meetings, I think, would be helpful. Yes. That's a good answer. Well, we are, time goes by so quickly. Ah, um, at this point, um, if anyone has questions, I'd love to turn our attention to the audience to see... Yeah. If you have questions, we are here and are would really love to take your questions and answer them. I did while we're waiting for that, I do have a question for you, Liz. I was I, was, I took furious notes as you were chatting. Um, and where's my question? Over over the time that you've met with artists, and I know that I, I had the privilege of having a portfolio review with you, and it really rocked my world. And, In person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, yeah, it was in person way back in the day. Um, and one of the things, the suggestions that you did really resulted in um the suggestions that you made for me resulted in work in the future. Okay. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, you chatted about um, how important personal stories are and as a way for photographers to kind of lodge themselves in your brain and for you to remind them, to remember them. Mm -hmm. um, how, what have you seen as a very... Um, a good way for photographers to tell their personal stories? What have been some things you've noticed in the past that really are kind of like, whether it's a standard or a hallmark of, of sharing their personal story that has stayed with you? And, and just to clarify your question, you're saying, how would they share it? Or how, what have they shared in the past? Um, yeah. That, yeah, that has stuck with you. Yeah. So, you know, when I would meet with photographers and we'd be having a really good conversation, sometimes they'd say, do you want to see my personal work? And it always made me feel special. Like, okay, we're having a good meeting. Thank you. You're going to show me the secret sauce. This is awesome. Um, and so, if that's what you meant by how that, you know, like it, it sort of comes out sometimes if I'm really into somebody's work, I just ask, do you have personal work you'd like to show? Or, you know, sometimes it just is like a natural part, part of the conversation, or it's the main thing they're showing it, their work is their personal work or the thing they, you know, maybe it's a repeat we've known each other. We've met several times. I know your commercial work. I've been on your site a thousand times. Let me show you something cool that I'm working on. Or sometimes it's a documentary project that continue, that keeps going. And you want to know more about the, the, the person that they had, a, had, had photographs of. And so it's a continuation and that, you know, I want to, I want to watch more. No, oh, perfect. Um, so we have a question from Severio. Severio asks, what can non-BIPOC creatives be doing now to have an impact in the area of increased inclusion in our industry? And is, is Severio asking as a photographer, what can photographers do? I think, I think so, because he's a photographer. Yeah. Hi, Severio. 
Um, <laughs> and he says well, yes, as a photographer. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, I think that, uh, I think that photographers should understand that there is a very diverse community of people who work in the industry, of stylists, of first assistants, of digitex, of DPs. Uh, and and I, I think that creating an inclusive set is only going to improve the quality of the work because the more diverse, the more creative, the more perspectives, the more experience. Thank you. Sure. I think that was our one question. It's a good one. It is. Oh, I see. Yep. That was our one question. So I can dismiss them. Um, oh, someone else just typed a question. Um, well, what, before we, while I read this, um, Rita, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, not necessarily. I think you and me covered pretty much everything. Great. Um, so this is an interesting question. I'll go mm -hmm. ahead and pose it. Um, um, the person says, who is anonymous, mm -hmm. says, you mentioned to put your identities in your email intro, like I am an Asian American and the photographer. Should a white person put, I am a white photographer, I feel like not including it would make white seem like the default. Hmm. Um, I wanna be very clear that I think it is the choice of the artist, how they want to introduce themselves. So Martine, you had said that you felt that it made a more comfortable meeting for you to sort of set the table and let somebody and describe identity before you meet with them. And that's your choice. And I think that's a, I think that's a, a perfectly reasonable and not atypical thing that I have seen in many introductions. Um, by not including it, I, I, I don't think that's a problem. I don't think it's a problem to not include that either and let the meeting um, reveal whatever a person wants to reveal about themselves. Some things we can see, other elements of identity we can't see. It's entirely up to the, the artist to determine. I, I just wanna stress that that agency is with you. You own the choice. That's important. I think that's the most important thing to leave people with is that the choice of how you de describe yourself and introduce yourself is yours and yours alone. I think that's a perfect place to end. Um, we are at seven o'clock. We like to start our scope on time yes. and we like to end on time. Um, Rita, thank you so much for joining us. C'était un plaisir. Um, <laughs> Liz, it's always a pleasure to see you. And I'm so pleased that both you and Rita are in Chicago. And perhaps at some point, we'll all meet in person. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, this episode of Scope will be Yes, this episode of Scope will be eventually will live on our YouTube channel. Um, and we on the APA YouTube channel, I should say. Mm -hmm. So that is I know that I will be rewatching it and I will be really taking notes anew for all of the wonderful things um, and tips that Liz shared with us. Thank you so much, everyone.
goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.